This truly remarkable organisation supports the men and women with illnesses and injuries they suffered while serving the British Armed Forces. No matter when someone served, this charity believes that those prepared to put their lives second deserve a second chance at life. I can only be speaking of Help for Heroes and the Rugby Business Network has the immense honour of being joined by Recovery Director for the organisation, retired Colonel David Richmond. David, thank you for taking the time to chat about your years in the Armed Forces as well as the work that you do now with Helpful Heroes. That's a pleasure. Good to speak to you. Well, David, let's start off with your role of Recovery Director at Helpful Heroes, where you have been since 2011. What is it exactly that your job entails? Well, I'm responsible for all the work that the charity does with our beneficiary group, which are the men and women of the armed forces, veterans, Mm -hmm. and the families of both groups. Uh, And we run a a, a significant national network in the UK, which provides services and support to them as they look to go on to lead active, independent and fulfilling lives after whatever has befallen them in service, be that wounding, injury or chronic sickness. Mm. Well, you also train and manage the UK Invictus Games teams. Uh, For our listeners who may not be entirely familiar with this, uh, can you explain what the Invictus Games are and uh, where do the tournaments take place and how often? Uh, The Invictus Games uh, was the brainchild of Prince Harry. Mm -hmm. It was an idea to bring together wounded injured and sick servicemen and veterans from a multitude of different nations into a multi-sports competition and to compete against each other in the same way they served alongside each other on operations. The first Games was in London in 2014. Uh, in 2016, it went to Orlando. And in 2017, just this September, we were in Toronto and next year goes to Sydney. Hmm. And the UK has um, entered a team into that for, the, for all three occasions. And, and we'll do again for, for Sydney, a team of Hopefully, we're looking at a team of 90. Uh, And the guys and girls compete on on a number of different individual and team sport. The idea uh, for Invictus really is not about the medals. Medals is is important, of course, and and sportsmen are competitive by nature. Mm. It's used as a catalyst for helping them on the ongoing recovery. So Mm. one of the things we talk to all of our team about is how are you going to take all the things you learn and all the opportunities you have through Invictus and use those to help yourself for the for the coming years. Amazing. Well, David, your main reason possibly for joining Help for Heroes comes uh, from your 26 years of service in the British Army. During that time, you served with infantry units in Bosnia as well as Iraq, as well as being lieutenant colonel, where you were the highest ranked British officer in Afghanistan. Looking back now, how would you describe your many years in the armed forces? Oh, I loved it. I had an absolutely fantastic time. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's uh, it suited me down to the ground. I've always been very active. I've always enjoyed being outside. I've always enjoyed being with people. Mm. And I've always enjoyed a, a real personal and, and team challenge. So um, for all those reasons, I absolutely love my time in the armed mm. forces. And I really would recommend it as a career to any like-minded um, young man or young woman. You, know, you get to go and experience a load of things at a young age or very early stage in your career mm. that you just don't, don't experience in other parts of society, I think. As a willing volunteer, I hasten to add, to go off and conduct you know, combat operations in various parts of the world. Mm. And that really is a test that, that strips you down to your bare metal when you get into that. Yeah, I look back on my 25, 26 years and I, I have absolutely no regrets whatsoever. I mean, notwithstanding getting shot at the end of it, um, <laughs> that rather comes comes with the turf, I'm mm. afraid. And um, I think the, the current societal trend to somewhat look at servicemen as victims mm. somehow, um, I think is, is, is not a good one. It, it's not an accurate one. It's not a positive one. Servicemen aren't victims. They're willing volunteers. We, we, we go away to far off and dusty lands to do these things because we want to, because we enjoy them. That's what we join to do. And the injury and illness uh, and wounding that might come with it are all part of the risk. Mm. Well, speaking of injuries and the risks that may come from it, uh, 12th of June 2008 is a day you will remember well, David. Please could you explain uh, for our listeners how this moment effectively ended your career in the army and the lengthy recovery period thereafter? I was commanding officer in a place called Musakala, which is in um, sort of northern Helmand province. Mm-hmm. Um, I was commanding a battle group operation just north of the town. Uh, a battle group can have any, any number of th- hundreds of people in it. And, and on that particular operation, we had, I think, 800 guys on the ground. Midway through the operation, I was, I was hit by an AK-47 round, which entered through the back of my right leg and exited rapidly through the front and sadly took 10 centimetres of my right femur with it, which was a shock. But again, you know, it's, it comes as part of the turf. I suppose I look at it 
slightly ruefully in that I'd served for 22 years by that point, so it had done 22 years to get me. Um, but they did in the end. To cut a very long story short, that led to, I very nearly lost my, um, lost my leg. They almost took it off in, in the field hospital at Camp Bastin. Thankfully they didn't, and I was then presented with a choice when we got back to Selly Oak that we, we could take this off, but it would be very high amputation, or we can have a go at rebuilding this, but it's a, it's a very, very long gap we need to fill. And we can't guarantee it's going to work. So what do you think? And I, I use my fairly simple infantryman's brain. I thought, well, you only get one pair of legs. And by definition, the last thing you do is, is you choose to have one of them taken off because there's no way back from there. So um, let's see what we can do. So I, I then entered to four years of reconstructive surgery and intensive rehab at, at uh, Headley Court, mm. which is the Defence Rehab Centre. And it was, it's, it's a bit of a roller coaster journey because these things never quite work out how you, uh, how you intend. And of course... A gunshot wound, by definition, is an open wound. You're at high risk of infection throughout the whole thing. I had two what were known as Lizarov fixators, which are metal um, or steel frames, which are essentially surgically attached to you. Mm -hmm. And I had, a, I had seven screws around them and, and a spanner. And every day I turned the screws four times and that stretched my leg out. And the bone chased the gap. In the middle of that, my leg bent and then I had another, another fixator put on and straightened it all back up. Um, and that probably lost me about a, about a year, I guess. Mm. At the end of it all, I, I now have a leg, which ironically, having been 10 centimetres too short, is now half a centimetre too long, <laughs> um, which is which is an hour and a half. Mm. I think because I worked really hard at my rehab, and I think this is the key thing, I think you need four, four things when you're going through your, your rehab. You need, you need a good, good surgeon, in my case, mm -hmm. and a team around him. You need a great rehab team. You need lots of luck on your side because it's not going to be a smooth journey. Um, so expect the bumps along the way. And then the last thing you need is you need to work really, really hard yourself because mm. nobody can do your rehab other than you. Mm. Um, and thankfully I did. Um, and um, I sort of reap the rewards now. And although I've got no quads on mm. my right leg because they were all, all taken off and they cleaned me out after the gunshot wound. Mm. My comeback moment in my mind was I, went, I did Ironman UK race in 2012, mm. uh, when it wasn't even a year after my final surgery. So mm. that was the point at which I thought, right, I'm back. I wasn't particularly gainly as I went round, and I certainly wasn't in the field to win it, but mm. I got to the end, and that was good enough for me. Mm. Incredible. Well, speaking of 2012, David, that was also the year you were awarded the CBE in the Queen's New Year's Honours List. Would you say this is one of the greatest achievements uh, in your life thus far? Oh, it was an, it was an extraordinary honour and privilege, yeah. I mean, I was, I was lucky enough that um, you don't know which of the members of the royal family are going to present your award mm. until you turn up on the day. And I was, I was delighted to see that the, Her Majesty the Queen was presenting on the, her awards that day, which was fantastic. No, it was great. I think it was a huge honour to receive a CBE. I thought it was absolutely fantastic also that um, it was a moment for my family because, of course, they ride the whole roller coaster journey with you. They'd suffered the long absences of a long military career. They'd, they'd, they'd had the knock at the door to say, your husband or your daddy has been seriously injured. And they'd gone through the whole roller coaster of, of emotions that go with a that moment and the long um, rehab and recovery that follows. So it was a fantastic day for us all and, and a great privilege. Brilliant. Well, David, there are a few similarities in terms of traits and skills that both the military and professional rugby team share. One in particular is leadership. During your time as a colonel, what were some of the lessons in leadership you learnt and that could possibly be applied in rugby? That's a good question. I think a couple of things immediately spring to mind. Mm -hmm. The first is that leadership is about the lead not about the leader. And I think guys, be they servicemen or sportsmen, really quickly see through you if your leadership is all, all about you. It isn't. If you want to be a good leader, you need to be, I mean, I subscribe to the notion of a servant leader. You're one of them. And you need to, you need to engage with these guys and girls. Uh, and it isn't about you. It's about them and how you can become a role model, you can try and set standards, but actually how can you help these guys and girls develop and perform of their best using the people skills you've got. And that takes me neatly to the second bit, mm -hmm. which is about, it's about people. Leadership is about human beings. Mm. You need to understand that everybody is wired differently and different things motivate different people in different ways. And it takes a, a real insight to understand what is, where the real drivers and motivators are to individuals in your team. You know, as a commanding officer, I, I, I would work really closely with my sort of senior team of company commanders who were, let's say there'd be eight of those. And they're all motivated differently. But I also had to get to know the guys and girls that, who would be deployed out in the ground with them and also share some of the risks, share some of the challenges. I'm a great believer in leading by example mm. and setting the standard and setting the tone. It doesn't mean to say you're the best at everything, but it means you can do everything. 
It means you, you're seen to be taking part, you're seen to be committing, you're seen to be sharing the risks and the challenges, and that you're human and that you can sit and talk to guys on a one-to-one -one level, mm. not as a master servant, but as a mano a mano, as I say. All those things bring you quite close to the people you lead. Don't remove for one second the need to win. You know, the military is an environment where losing isn't an option. You can't go into a firefight. You can't go into a major operation prepared to lose. People's lives depend on this very literally and, and very quickly. Letting these guys and girls see that you too have some vulnerabilities. You too have some uncertainties, but actually you're confident in, in what you're going to do. You understand them, you can relate to them, you're one of them, and you're competent in the sporting world as much as it is in the military one. Mm -hmm. In training, they might follow you out of curiosity. When the bullets are real, they won't. They'll follow you because they trust you and because you're competent. Hmm. So very interesting similarities you mentioned there when it comes to leadership in both the military and uh, professional rugby teams. Well, Help for Heroes was launched on the 1st of October in 2007, and since then it has been using sport and specifically rugby to help raise funds for the charity why does this link exist between the two david sport can be a huge a great catalyst mm. for the recovery of wounded injured sick servicemen and, and servicewomen it gets the competitive edge going again it you know it's good for your physical fitness it's mm. good for your well-being the socially it's all the bits of sport you enjoy when you're fully able-bodied, well, you can enjoy them too when you're not. And that's where, where the benefits of things like the Invictus Games and the Warrior Games and our wider sports recovery program are concerned. Yeah, they they bring, bring you back to that. Mm. And rugby, I think, has always been a great supporter. There's all, rugby has always been very close to the service community. Um, you know, one of the biggest uh, attended rugby matches of the year is the Army-Navy game at Twickenham every year, every May, I think it is. Uh, which sells the place out. I mean, that's two amateur teams. Mm. Sells out Twickenham every year. Wow. And we've held two big fundraising rugby matches at Twickenham ourselves, mm. where the rugby community from across the world, the stars from across the rugby world, came and played to raise money for wounded injured sick servicemen. And I think that the values that rugby um, subscribes to are very, very similar in so many ways to the values of, of the military community of teamwork and humility and integrity and helping each other and, and all those great things. And therefore, there's a very neat match between the sport, which is rugby, and the profession, which is the, the profession of arms and the, the three single services. I like how you mentioned there that the values of rugby are also mirrored in the military. Well, Help for Heroes is also an active uh, charity partner of the Rugby Business Network, as you will know, David. How did this uh, come about and what makes this partnership so effective? Tom Hannon, the, uh, the founder of the Rugby Business Network, um, became involved with Help for Heroes and helped us with a number of, of um, so career recovery orientated programs mm -hmm. and linked us very closely to the Rugby Business Network. Yeah, one of the key aspects of of the work that we do with wounded and sick servicemen is that we are encouraging them all to move on to lead active, independent and fulfilling lives. Mm -hmm. And a key component of that is to move into employment, training, educational volunteering. And through the network, which is the Rugby Business Network, of course, we can link guys, the, the fantastic people who belong to that network, where the ethos is, how can I help you? And I think that's a fantastic ethos to have because you know, these guys and girls come with a multitude of, of skills. Uh, they come with years and years of experience. They come with a positivity and, and, of course, the life skills all enhanced by having lived through whatever it is their, their wounding injury or sickness has been. Mm -hmm. And they have a huge amount to offer to employers and society at large and therefore linking in to the the great network which is the rugby business network is is a fantastic opportunity for us and one that help for heroes is keen to nurture over the years mm. and it's also fantastic for the rugby business network to have help for heroes as one of our charity partners well there are obviously opportunities for both businesses and individuals to offer their support uh, for help for heroes and all they need to do is visit the website which is www.helpforheroes.org.uk for for our rugby fanatics, David, what sort of fundraising initiatives are there for them to get involved with? Oh, blimey. Well, we've got um, a, a wide range of initiatives. They range from the annual Big Battlefield Bike Ride, which um, takes a couple of hundred fundraisers on a bike ride through the battlefields of, of Northwest Europe. Yeah. Um, it's a different route every year. I'm not sure what the route is this coming year. The year we just passed, they went to the bridge at Arnhem mm -hmm. uh, and uh, celebrated there. That's one stop along the way, but that was the main, the main stop. So that will happen every year. That's great fun, and that would play very nicely to the rugby community because there's a lot of this great camaraderie. They get to ride alongside some of the wounded, injured, sick guys, uh, and then in the evening, once people have had a shower, 
then a few beers are had and, and fun, the fun starts before we get on our bikes and go again in the morning. I think it ranges from that all the way through to companies identifying Help for Heroes as a charity of the year and raising money through their employees and, and and CSP programs for a 12 month period or longer mm. or it could be um, individual fundraising initiatives so somebody might want to take part in, in the London Marathon or I don't know sit in a bath and bake beans for, for 24 hours or something mm. or bounce on a trampoline until they can bounce no more mm-hmm. whatever it is all those initiatives um, are initiatives which raise money for us and Help for Heroes has, has no government funding whatsoever and therefore all that we do is utterly reliant on the donations of individuals and businesses mm. so um I'd advise anybody looking to fundraise to look at our, our, the fundraising area of our website. Mm-hmm. All the challenges are on there, or, or just to cast their mind to what they might be able to do themselves. And it might just—I mean, we, we have a every year there's a barbecue, there's a fundraising barbecue, there's a fundraising cake sale, all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. which is fairly um, low level and fairly easy for people to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so even if it's selling some cakes in your offices. Um, and putting the, giving the proceeds to help here is anything like that would be hugely welcome and helps us do the work that we um, set out to achieve for our service community. Such a wonderful variety of initiatives uh, to get involved with. Well, finally, David, in 2018, all of the Help for Heroes funded facilities at uh, Headley Court will be transferred to a bigger, newer and purpose-built facility at uh, Stanford Hall in Leicestershire. Does this move affect you at the charity at all? And what are some of the other plans that you may have for next year? It doesn't affect us directly at, at all. So mm-hmm. it's great that the facilities we've um, we funded at Headley Court will be replicated up at Stanford Hall mm-hmm. at no additional cost to the charity because that was part of the part of the arrangement for it being moved. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's really good news. We'll continue to have a presence at Stanford Hall in the same way we had at Headley Court, and therefore that very close link to the serving military community will still be there, which is which is crucially important. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think for the next year, the, the charity is going to look very hard at rolling out support teams into into the community regionally uh, and starting to move before, beyond our four recovery centres and therefore able to reach many more of the, um, we know at least 66,000 or more individuals who have served in the armed forces who uh, are likely to need support in the coming years. Mm-hmm. And we'll be moving our support closer to them. Those are the key chunks, I think, of what's going to happen mm-hmm. in the next 12, 12 to 18 months, alongside increasing, I think, our capacity to support those with uh, mental health c- conditions alongside those with physical health conditions. I'm also going to continue chairing uh, the contact group, um, which is brings together um, those charities involved in delivering mental health to the armed forces community mm-hmm. um, with NHS and the Ministry of Defence and the Royal Foundation. Uh, and continue to see what we can do to, to improve the, the quality of service that veterans can access um, once they leave the service. Uh, and um, I've got a couple of physical challenges I need to sort out. I think mm-hmm. I'd like to do one more Ironman. I think I'm, then I might hang up my trainers mm-hmm. um, and, uh, and go and watch a lot of rugby, I think. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. Well, David, your unwavering desire to offer support, not just during your many years on the battlefields, but also afterwards for those wounded physically and mentally is incredibly motivating. Thank you for providing the Rugby Business Network with the opportunity to hear a bit more about Help for Heroes and may the charity continue to make a difference in the lives of those that need assistance. It's been a pleasure talking to you.